Hey everybody, welcome to Babuti Chim's YouTube channel. We have another special guest here today is Guardian. He's back. How's it going, everybody? Today we're going to be talking about the decision whether to play or draw, if you've been given that decision. And I think Justin has a little bit of history and context about this. Yeah, so for those who are maybe newer to the game, or you know, even if you've only joined the game uh, in the last couple of years, um, I thought it'd be fun to kind of start with a little history of like the, the first versus second uh, decision uh, in terms of redemption. Uh, so going back to the very beginning, and I'm, I'm literally talking about the very you know, start of the game, the original rules. Uh, the original rule was that on their first turn, uh, neither player drew three. Mm -hmm. So it was just, you know, you, you would uh, draw your opening hands, you would see who had the most lost souls, person who had the most lost souls in play after the opening hand to get the choice to go first or second. And because neither player drew for their first turn, the choice was always to go first, mm -hmm. no matter what. There was yeah. literally was no choice. There's no incentive to going second. Yeah, it was just, you know, even if you didn't have a hero, you, you were still going to be the first person to draw for turn, which, you know, meant that you would have a chance to uh, draw a hero. Like, going second, yep. there wasn't going to be a chance that you drew a hero for your first turn because you weren't going to draw at all. Mm -hmm. So back, and I actually, I just looked this up a few minutes ago. I wasn't sure if I'd be able to find it. Uh, back in the 2009-2010 uh, season, uh, so sometime, sometime after uh, the Nationals, um, of Nationals 2009, uh, we made a change with uh, Rob approving it, uh, by we, I mean the, the elder team, mm -hmm. that the player who went second would get to draw three on their first turn. Mm -hmm. But that was a, a pretty, pretty big change. Um, it was obviously meant to help uh, kind of balance that, um, you know, to, to, to take away the advantage of going first, making it actually uh, a choice. Yeah, adding more strategic depth to the game too is always nice, and it's not even like that complicated of a rule or anything. Yeah, it was. It was a pretty simple change, um, and orig and initially, you know, it didn't actually uh, affect people's decisions a whole lot. Uh, most people still just went first if they if they had the most souls, they wanted to go first. And then kind of slowly after a little bit of time, I don't remember exactly when, but people started realizing that, hey, wait a minute, actually getting to draw the first three cards at the, you know, at the very start of the game when you're you're trying to get resources out and you're trying to, you know, in, implement your strategy for what your deck is trying to do, um, actually getting the first draw three mm -hmm. actually seemed like it might not be the worst thing. Yeah. Um, a, a part of this was also the the types of decks that were being played at the time. Um, I'd say in the kind of in the mid two thousands, um, there was a big emphasis on uh, speed decks, so decks that were trying to draw a lot of cards right away, um, get ahead, uh, get their get to their dominance. And I think what people started to realize was, you know. If the second player, you know, basically automatically gets to draw three, because that's now the rule, mm -hmm. you could start to play a more balanced deck, um, have a little more defense in your deck. And if you were able to, you know, make a successful block or at least kind of generate some uh, some value from blocking your opponent's first rescue and then get to re, you know, automatically refill your hand with three yeah. cards yeah. going second... You, you wouldn't be in the worst shape. And a lot of times you would actually um, be in a better position. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that started to shift a little bit and, and players started to kind of think like, hey, this this whole going second thing um, may not be the worst thing, which is kind of what we wanted as a, uh, you know, as an elder team, as a design team. You know, that's what you kind of want for the game. We started getting to a point where um, Lost Souls started giving card advantage. And um, since at the time there was no uh, restriction on the reserve, so this would be um, around the time of like uh, Revelation of John, Fall of Man, uh, Cloud of Witnesses, when those sets came out, 
Um, you know, so the reserve was introduced, obviously, with the revelation of John. And then uh, after Fall of Man released, we had uh, five lost souls. Um, or actually, it, it would be a little bit later than that, because it would be with Prophecies of Christ. Um, when, when Prophecies of Christ was released, we had five lost souls that could put you up a card before the game even started. Um, so we had Prosperity Lost Soul, which you could discard one to draw two. Yep. You had the ex Exiles Lost Soul, which could grab uh, an artifact from your reserve. The Remnant Lost Soul, which could grab a hero from your reserve. That's busted. Uh, the Lawless, yep. The Lawless Lost Soul, which grabs an evil card from your top six. And then Darkness Soul, uh, which could grab an evil character, because if you drew it in your opening eight, you obviously wouldn't have any yep. evil characters in play. So with with the, all those lost souls, it was suddenly becoming a situation where, all right, I don't care if I'm not drawing on my first turn because I might have two or three cards in my hand extra to start the game anyway. Yeah. And so it's like I'm not even having a disadvantage of not being able to draw. Uh, so then the game did another shift where it went back to, all right, I hope, I'm hoping I draw as many of my lost souls as I, you know, as possible give me a couple two three four extra cards to start the game and now going first is is back to being advantageous mm -hmm. so then uh as you know games shift and and evolve uh, the elder team decided that you know what we needed to maybe do something with um you know how these how these games are often coming down to just who who drew their um you know their souls who, who drew more souls at the beginning? Um, the game had literally gone from, you know, like, oh man, I drew all my souls on the first <laughs> turn and my opponent just got them all to, oh, I didn't draw any souls and that's why I lost. <laughs> right. <laughs> because it's I like, didn't get any extra value. It turned the game upside down because lost souls started getting so good that actually not drawing any on your opening turn actually caused you to put you at a significant disadvantage. Yep, exactly. So, so then with the, you know, the elder team decided, you know what, let's, you know, the reserve was meant to be, uh, it was not meant or intended to be something that basically could set up your deck, you know. It was meant to be something where you could keep cards that, you know, you either wanted later in the game or cards that, you know, could help against a certain strategy that the cards mm -hmm. in your main deck might struggle against. Um, like one of the early examples was, um, you know, when when site decks kind of used to be part of the part of the format, and you might not want to put like a a multicolor site in your main deck, right? Because against a lot of decks, it's not going to do anything, right? Um, but if you run into a site deck, well, you better have enough site access because um, they were probably going to have two or three ways to, you know, get rid of your site access. So you might need some extra that you could keep in the reserve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that really, so that change um that the the elder team decided on um that started to shift things a little bit back to you know the middle where you know there, maybe there was a little bit more of a choice and i know for myself um i started building decks that liked to go second um because i could what i could what i would do is i put evil characters in that were really strong turn one either draw engines yep. or search engines uh, so a card like the, the Nebuchadnezzar from Treasures, uh, the Treasure Set, um, where if you could block with Nebuchadnezzar turn one, he could pull out a, a Crimson card and add it to battle. So I could pull out like a, a draw three card. Um, a Betrayal was a really good card from Prophecies of Christ that would underdeck a card, a good card from the opponent's hand. Um, and then if it was played in battle, you get to draw three. That was a... Uh, kind of a strategy I had was, yeah, I want to go second. Mm -hmm. Hopefully my opponent, you know, doesn't have anything too crazy. Um, I block with Nebuchadnezzar. I play Betrayal. I underdeck their best good card in hand. I get to draw three for my turn, and hopefully, you know, I was able to underdeck whatever they would have to negate, and then I just am way ahead at that point. Yeah. Um, and then on going second, obviously, I get to draw three for my turn, and I'm probably just way way ahead at that point uh, yeah. damsel of divination was another one um that could obviously draw a lot of cards um if the opponent's hand wasn't protected 
at that time there was there was far less uh, hand protection options yeah. Yeah. available. So she would often get to draw at least two or three cards if she was the a turn one blocker. Um, so then the kind of next uh, part of this was the change from uh, deciding who got to choose. So um, I don't remember exactly if this was like two or three seasons ago. Um, where the the other team decided that instead of you know whoever had the most lost souls got to choose, it would just be a random choice. So like with a die roll or like a rock paper scissors, and you know basically the choice became random, who would get to choose. Um, and so I think that kind of and that obviously that leads us up to today and the reason that we're doing this uh, video is to talk about you know it's. I think now more than at any point in the game, uh, the decision to choose wisely when you have the choice uh, to choose wisely whether you should be going first or going second. Um, I think it's just it's it, it's it's a really important decision that you want to be you, know, you want to make it wisely. Yeah. Uh, you're not always going to get it right. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that, but. Yeah. I think it's it's super important to be prepared for when you do get that uh, to make that choice that you um, that you do uh, that you do make a, a good one. When I was returning back to the game in 2024, to me, I made the assumption like going first is always the best thing to do. And as I'm learning more and more about the game, I'm starting to encounter all these situations and even play different decks where I've started to question that assumption. So I hope this video is going to be helpful for especially newer players who maybe haven't gotten to be exposed to these ideas before. And so we're going to start to break down some more specific examples about certain scenarios about when you might want to consider going second or not. Yeah, so I think, like I said, the the choice, um, so it's a choice you're going to get about 50% of the time. Um, but every time that you do get to make it, um, it's going to have um, an impact on the game, whether you make the right choice or the wrong choice. And again, it's, it's not a choice you're always going to get right. Um, you, the redemption is a game of missing information. And if you don't have, when you have information that's, that's missing, you know, when you don't know everything, you, you can't make, um, the optimal choice. Like you're, you're you, you know, you're, you're, you're guessing a little bit, um, you know, and so the, the choice is not always going to be the same. Like Tim was saying, the, there's going to be some decks that are more likely to want to go either first or second, um, but every game is gonna be different. Um, and you, so you really wanna make sure that you're evaluating um, all the information that you do have. So when we talk about information that you do have, um, is one is your opening hand, so what eight cards you have, uh, what your opponent might be playing, and sometimes you might know some of this is sometimes you might not, you know, some games you're just going to go in, you have no idea what deck your opponent is playing. Other times you do, you might be playing against someone who's known to play a certain kind of deck, but you can kind of have a little bit of a guess. Yeah. Um, you, you see what lost souls. And then the third is you see what lost souls you have and what lost souls the opponent has. And, and that, you know, the lost souls that the opponent has might tell you a little bit about what deck uh, they're playing. And so that kind of plays into that that second one about what what your opponent might be playing uh, if you if you see some of their lost souls on the table. Uh, so those are the that's the information that you have uh, to work with. Um, and I think and then one other just kind of you know closing or uh, you know point to make on that is um, what you definitely don't want to do is is make up your mind like before you evaluate everything. Like if you just go in to the game. Thinking, okay, no matter what, if I if I win the die roll, I'm going first. Mm -hmm. And see, that's just that's just a mistake. Like yeah. you you when you have that mindset and you're not evaluating the information that you have, um, you're just you're not setting yourself up for uh, you know to to be successful. Mm -hmm. Especially even if you're playing like one of the fastest decks out there, I like having that open mindset and just being open to looking at all the information and making the best decision every game. Yep, absolutely. All right. Do you want to hop into Lackey and start looking at some specific scenarios that we want to talk about? Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. 
Okay. Jump onto your table here. So we both prepared some decks that have interesting decisions about um, going first or second. So the deck that I've been really enjoying lately is this Daniel's Terminator deck that I can show you guys really quickly. But the idea, it's a more defensive heavy deck and it actually doesn't mind going second because of how much defense it plays. So normally, like I shifted the ratio of normally like how many offensive cards there are in Daniel decks and I shifted the cards out of Daniel and into the defense. And so the plan is like, I'm able to absorb their initial blows and if I'll get the blocks over the course of the game. And eventually like my Daniel def attack is just gonna grind them out of the game. And so this mm -hmm. is a deck that I think is a great example of decks that don't mind going second because they, they wanna do the resources and they can get a good block off on turn one. So, so that's the deck I'll be bringing to the table. What about you, Mr. Guardian? Um, I think I'll do a test draw, at least uh, the first one I'll, or maybe first one or two I'll do uh, is with the GoldenEye deck that I've been uh, playing quite a bit the last few months. Okay. Uh, it's definitely a deck that uh, most of the time wants to go second. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's going a lot better if I get to block first and generate some value um, with one of the evil characters, like a damsel or a lying prophet that gets to look at the opponent's hand and hopefully draw a few cards. Or in the uh, the perfect scenario, if my opponent does a turn one Matthew and I get to block with uh, the herdsman. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a, it's a most of the time wants to go second deck, but you know, I, but again, like I said, you know, I I want to keep an open mind about you know each each hand. You know, there there are still hands. You know, combinations of uh, you know eight cards that I would have in my opening that sometimes are going to dictate that nope, I mm -hmm. should actually go first and and try to get ahead. And uh, just to balance it out, I'm also going to bring a Nazareth Turbo Nazareth deck to the table, and this is more of like a type of deck that wants to really go first and race the opponent and be as fast as possible. So I'll also bring that to the table yep. and yeah, let's yeah. just get into it and just see if we can find opening hands that are interesting to talk about. All right. I'll draw eight and I've revealed my hand to you. You'll be able to, I think you should be able to see it on your screen then. Okay. So I rolled a I two. What did you roll? Uh, six. Six. Okay. So you get the choice. Don't look at my hand, but just think about, the lost souls are, that are out here and, and all the information you have. And I guess I'm going to take a sneak peek at your hand and start trying to figure out what you're thinking. Okay, so you have Scattered Sheep, which is a great star ability, which could be interesting. Um, teaching in parables, virgin birth. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so this one is, this one's interesting. Um, so yeah, I've got the Scattered Sheep. I've got, you know, I've got three great black enhancements and no evil character to play on them, uh, or to play play them on. Uh, so this one's actually kind of tricky. Like I, I actually have so one of my one of my best uh, turn one rescues is actually uh, Simon of Cyrene, who I actually have in hand. Um, so it's a uh, a play I like to make where I go Simon to activate New Covenant and grab either yep. teaching in parables or amazing faith yep uh so this is actually this is a, this is a tricky one um i may still choose to go second and hope that my opponent so I, what i think i might still do is i think i i choose to go second and i hope that my scattered sheep and knock out whatever you know, crazy play they might have. So, mm -hmm. like, if they have a way, uh, or if you have a way to get to, like, uh, Matthew, or if you're playing a Daniel deck, if you have a way to, like, get Daniel and Michael or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I think I would try to eliminate any chance you have of, like, banding, or, like, you know, if like, you have, like, a, a negate hero, and hope that maybe my Blood Avenger can get the, the turn one, uh, you know, like, chump block, essentially, where I... A block, let him die by numbers, and then discard a, a lone hero. Right. Because people want to try to make the strongest attack possible on turn one. So if you're underdecking a hero from their hand, and then they're attacking with their strongest hero, they're probably going to run that straight into your Blood Avenger, and you might just get a free block. Yep, yep, exactly. So that's, I, I, so I think this is still, 
um, a turn two or, or a go second hand, um, even though I don't have any black evil characters to block yep. with and use some of these these strong enhancements. Yep. Um, there's there's always a chance the, uh, the virgin birth can stab good. you, grab you a character to block with, but that's not guaranteed. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, virgin birth can definitely, and in this and in this deck, I'm using both of the um, evil dominance that can add to battle. Yeah. Uh, so either of those can can basically turn into a black evil character if that's what it comes to. So yeah, the more I think about it, this is absolutely a go second hand where I can use scattered sheep. I can um, I can actually under deck. I would probably see. I would probably wait to see what you have before I decided which hero I want to get rid of. Um, whether it's the Angel of the Winds or the mm -hmm. Simon of Cyrene. Um, once I get to see your hand, that helps me um, evaluate my my decision for which hero I'm willing to let go. Yep. Okay, that makes sense. I would say it was one last thing. So what I probably would do even is I would order my star abilities uh, such that uh, I would do Virgin Birth first, and then um, if I get a Black Evil character, I could even not even need the Blood Avenger at this point if I end up finding a black evil character. That's another hero oh. that I could under deck to scattered sheep. And then that leaves my options open with Angel of the Winds or Simon of Cyrene for my my turn one. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's head over to my hand. Um, I am playing the Turbo Nazareth deck. Mm -hmm. And so this deck is all about trying to get Nazareth into play after kind of doing your own thing. And hopefully that's going to be enough to disrupt the opponent. So... Right off the bat, I do have a way to draw some cards. I already have uh, Emperor, and I have this. Um, I have a great, I have a way to get Matthew on turn one too. So I feel like this is a hand where I'm definitely wanting to go first because uh, just being able to draw Matthew and then draw into all my good fortresses that protect my stuff and Nazareth to play during my discard phase. I feel like even though I have yeah, some this, this points, yeah, yeah, this definitely looks like a a go first hand where you're. You're gonna draw, you know, you're gonna draw three off Daenerys. You're probably gonna draw minimum four or five off the Matthew. Um, obviously it depends, you know, your your sequencing depends a lot on what you draw with Daenerys. Um, but you've already got some strong, you know, blocking options. You've got some three woes to kinda, you know, back up either your attack yeah. or your block. Uh, and you've got the Yeah. And by choosing, if I ever chose to go second, that would just give opponents so much time to activate their artifacts that would prevent me from searching or play fortresses yep. that would stop me from actually looking at their hand, like a storehouse or Bethlehem stable, yep. or even getting territory characters out like Priest of Zeus that punishes me for drawing cards. Yep. Yep. This is, yeah, this is pretty, this is a, a pretty easy one, I think, as far as yeah. deciding, yeah. Um, you know, absolutely want to go first. Uh, with with this type of hand. Um, interestingly, I, so the Lost Souls that came out, I don't really think they are necessarily relevant to either of our decisions. No. Um, no. So sometimes that's going to be the case where, you know, either there's no Lost Souls or there's just ones that, that aren't relevant to, you know, choosing first or second. Okay. I'm going to load in a different deck now and just do some more opening hands here. More decisions we can talk about if you want. Yep, I'll also load a new deck. I think there's also like another mini game you can play with uh, going first or second is like the, the situations where like I have all the lost souls in play and the opponent has none. Then it's just like, I think that's also interesting decision. Mm -hmm. All right. So, yep, I did not draw any souls in this hand. Yeah. All right. Want to look at uh, my hand or your hand first? Um, let's look at my hand. This is a very weird hand. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> This is a disaster of a hand if I've ever seen one. Oh, yeah. It's just all my enhancements and all my tutors that go search for angels, but no angels. And mm -hmm. ideally, I like to play down a bunch of characters and a bunch of artifacts before I play Mayhem. But I think Mayhem's just going to yep. have to um, shuffle, like basically take a mulligan because I have a Mayhem in my hand. Um, but as far as yeah, like going yeah, think, first or second. I think... I think you have. I think you can still go second because you have uh, darkness lost soul. So you you probably go second. Yeah. Um. You, know, you you grab like a if you're running like a Malachite slave or deceiver, you probably grab one of those. 
Mm -hmm. And then on your block, um, you know, probably uh, find a way to Nicodemus, you know, either with assuming you have Nicodemus in the, the defense. Yep. Um, so it's probably like a, an, a deceiver to a Malachite slave to Nicodemus type sequence because um, you've got two that a negate and an interrupt discard yep. uh, on Nicodemus. Nicodemus is going to draw you two cards. So, you know, pretty likely that with the two cards from Nicodemus, mm -hmm. three cards for your first turn, you find a hero to yep. kind of start getting into. Yeah, so this is definitely... Definitely a go second hand. Yep, because it just maximizes the number of cards I can draw from my defense who likes drawing cards, and then hopefully I'll draw a hero to, in time to take my yep. first turn. Yep. Okay, let's take a look at your hand, see if we got any other decisions we got looking at. Yep, so this one I think is, this deck does like to go first. Uh, or I'd say it's, it's a little more balanced, um, probably weighted a little bit more towards wanting to go first. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of the idea with this deck, it's a, a Sons of Jacob with kind of a gray, a uh, mix of a gray, a couple different gray uh, defenses. Um, I've got some Moabites and some Syrians and then Lying Prophet. Uh, but the the offense is, is a hand control offense. So right off the bat, I've got my Joseph and my First Sacrifice. So I can underdeck... Um, evil card from your hand and then i probably you know so I, I think this is a go first because i have first sacrifice attack with joseph get uh the out of their hands dominant and you know if you have two evil cards that um you know are gonna be troublesome for me i just take out your two best yeah. evil cards yeah and you even have stricken uh, as another way to make your attack more potent because if I have a card like Malkite Slave, I can't even use it to search my deck because my deck's protected because it's stricken. Yeah, so what probably probably in this sequence, you know, it would be something where, you know, you'd be wanting to go second, I'd be wanting to go first. So whoever wins the die roll <laughs> probably doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Um, right. I do my stricken, which I think forces you use darkness to grab your Nicodemus uh, you have Nicodemus in hand and then I just use Joseph for sacrifice and yeah. under deck your Nicodemus and then you're and you're really far behind you don't get the Nicodemus draw you don't get to you know disrupt my hand with the philosophy or the tenants kill the sun um, so that is the you know that that is one of the drawbacks of going going second is that you know, sometimes your opponent is just going to have the exact card they need turn one to, you know, mess up your your best plan. Um, you're mm -hmm. when you're going when you're going second. Uh, you know, normally normally your hand wouldn't be a problem if we if you knew that yeah you're going to get Nicodemus and be able to block with them. <laughs> um, but it just so happened that the the hand I had was a pretty powerful uh, yeah. turn one hand. The interesting thing about darkness is I can put them into play. So if I'm suspecting, or if I played you in the past and I know you like to do hand control, a way to play around kind of what you're doing is I could put the, the character directly into play. That's just a side note. Yep. Yeah. So if you, yeah, if you did something like that, then that definitely maybe changes my, my plan of attack a little bit there. Um, obviously with first sacrifice, you know, I, I talked kind of in the introduction about the, you know, perfect versus imperfect information. And so that's why I like cards that let me look at my opponent's hand, because then I have perfect information. Yeah. Um, I know exactly what they have. I know what resources that they have. I know what's the minimum number of resources that I will have to invest in order to make a successful rescue. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes so, you can just like try to overcommit for a rescue. And because, for example, in that hand, I think I was sitting on a lot of like negates. I had like two negates. So if you had perfect information, you'd be able to figure out, okay, like I'm never winning this battle. I shouldn't try to use my negates yep. to win it. Negate war. I should just let it happen. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, so then I'm not, I'm not wasting negates. I'm, I'm waiting for a better spot where I yeah, can, yeah. you know, maybe win the negate war if I've got three to your two or something like that. So I have an interesting question for you. So what if you knew for a fact that you're playing against a Daniel deck? Um, would that affect your ability to go first or second just because you have stricken in your hand? So if I 
suspected. So like with this hand, I'm I think I'm always going first. Um, I I don't necessarily mind going second. Uh, again, because of the stricken, the stricken is just a crazy card to have in your opening hand. Um, whether whether you go first or second, this is, this is definitely a hand where I'm I'm totally fine going second. I could get a very potentially get a really good draw off line profit and then have Christian Martyr to back it up. Uh, so yeah. that is that's super. You know, nice. That's a really strong turn one block where I get to draw, probably win the battle. Um, if they banned, I could put, I can do line profit, play stricken to reserve one hero, play Christian Martyr on the other hero. Yep. Um, this is by no means like a, I have to go first hand. This is a this is actually a great hand for for going first or second. Um, generally, if I if I had the choice with this hand, I think I'm probably probably wanting to go first um, and just trying to and although part of it might depend on um, what I think my opponent is playing, you know, if I know, let's say that, um, well, I, no, I, I take that back. I think I'm always, I think I'm always going first if given the choice with this hand, but I'm, I'm certainly not upset if I have to go second and I, you know, kind of can make some of those plays that I, that I mentioned with lying profit. Yep. So even, even if I suspect that my opponent is on certain type of deck uh i think i'm just always wanting you know hoping to go first with this hand mm -hmm. all right yeah let's do let's do one more different deck here roll oh i got a five to your four this is a this is a spicy one mm. let's see it all right oh this one so first so off like a... what's what's your deck trying to do here what what deck are you bringing to the table uh, so this is a angels and demons deck um, with a little bit with uh, with a Daniel. Um, it's got like Daniel and uh, righteous seeker, the symbolic hero, um, basically just for some extra banding. Uh, and the defense is just a massive orange defense, a dragon, king of Tyrus, fallen star, just a bunch of big bad demons with. Uh, with a couple of the gates, uh, gates of hell. It's got a couple of the orange human evil characters, so <laughs> I can use gates of hell and shield yeah, to extend that's nice. battles. That's really nice. So, okay, so tell me yeah, what you're this thinking. One, yeah, this one is actually. I don't have any souls, so that's also relevant. Because part of me wants to go second because I've got red dragon and I've got two negates to play on him. And I don't really have a great attack. I mean, I've got Daniel backed up by Angel of the Lord, but that's that's nowhere near as powerful as I'd like it to be. Um, you know, they have a they have a Christian Martyr to play on Daniel after I play my Angel. Then it's like, man, I you know that that's that's two really good cards that I got nothing out of yeah. basically. What part of um, you on the other hand wants to go first because you can get that sweet sweet chance of activating blindness on turn one if they're like a search deck yeah and that's that's where i'm that's the kind of the the debate i'm having is you know getting shield down like if they somehow generate a lost soul um getting gates of hell down getting blindness activated like um i, I think about one of the you know the honeypot deck loves to search on turn one yeah and i had a game a couple weeks ago uh, where I played this deck against an opponent playing Honeypot, and all of their searches were the kind that blindness hits, where because they're, wow. they're taking specific cards, like you know, play the Wilderness of Sinai to take Moses, you know, or take an Exodus hero. Well, you get a random card yeah. now, or <laughs> you know, yeah. um, Covenant with David to, to take something. Well, you get a random card, and I yeah, I had the blindness turn one, and it just completely shut down like it, it was just it made it so awkward for the opponent like mm -hmm. they were they were still kind of like drawing a card every time they you know quote unquote searched um so it wasn't like they were missing out on value but their cards were completely it, they weren't getting optimal value or anywhere close to it uh one of the random yeah. takes was actually a lost soul so that just went into play <laughs> so that was like that's oh, so good they played their search and oh i get a lost soul out of that so yeah, turn one blindness is definitely a reason to 
to go first. And like if I suspected that my opponent was on a deck like the Honeypot deck, I would absolutely go first and get that blindness activated turn one. Yeah. Like what if this is like a big high stakes tournament match and you know the people like are bringing their best to the tournament. Like I think I would be out on the safe side. I want to get the blind house off because maybe there's a 50% chance that just wins me the game. <laughs> yeah. The other thing to think about too is with, with Daniel, I have Daniel can look at the opponent's hand. Mm. So I rescue with Daniel. If I see that Angel of the Lord wins a soul, then I'll use it. Yeah. Yeah. If I see that Angel, if I use Angel, they're gonna have like a, a Christian martyr or a falling away or some other way to, you know, stop me from actually rescuing. That's a good point. I'll just let Daniel be discarded, you know, yeah. if they have a you know, make them spend some resources. Even if it's like you know, they block with Goliath. Well, that's that's fine. I mm -hmm. you know I wouldn't mind that at all because then Daniel doesn't doesn't die. Um, if they have something like a King of Tyrus that discard you know ends up discarding Daniel, not a big deal. I've got the I've got the angel that can get him back. Um, yep. So yeah, the more the more I look at it, I think this this is definitely uh, a situation where I can I can go first, get that blindness active, and you know and probably. Uh, you know, hope to draw into some more offense um, on my second turn. I, I think the case becomes even more compelling if you do have Lost Souls because getting that shield down, now it says, opponent, if you search on your turn, th this Lost Soul is getting underdecked and no Lost Soul for you. So I like this, yeah, de this hand even more yeah. if you're going first and if you have Lost Souls out. Yeah, yeah. With blindness and shield, like, that just punishes search so hard. Yeah. So um, I'm actually right, packing um, Augur the Wise's newspaper deck. It's a nativity okay. deck that loves trying to play the resurrection on turn one and get out a bunch of fortresses. Sure. Um, already, I can have a good incentive to go first. Priest of Zeus, if you draw cards, you're yep. starting to get punished for that. Yep. Although, yeah, this, yeah, let's see. I do have a way to draw three right off the bat. Yep, and then you can potentially use pretension for another draw two. Yeah, this this also looks like a, a go first hand, like because you're going to be drawing so many cards, like you're you're basically, you know, undoing the fact that you're not drawing three for turn because yeah. you're drawing five. <laughs> so if I really wanted to fire this pretension off, I could play it before I play any heroes down. Could I could I even play it if I had no heroes in play or if there were no heroes in play? Um, there's no target yeah. for it. Yeah, you could still yeah you could still play it. Um. Because you can, you basically, if you did play a hero, then you would have to reserve your own hero. Um, but if there's no heroes to target, then you just, um, and there's, there's no heroes that get reserved. Okay. So I guess cool tip with pretension, if you want to just cycle it to draw two cards, which is a territory yep. class card to draw two cards. Like, that's not bad. Right. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a really good card. Um, you know, I would probably, I'd probably fire off. The Denarius first. Mm -hmm. Thinking with that sequence, um, the one thing that you do have to think about is that you know you're if you are going first, there are no souls to go after. Yeah, so, that is true. Um, so like I do all this drawing, but, I, but like for what? What's my what am I trying to do? Yeah, I mean, if, I, I you know I assume you're playing some like either lost souls or harvest lost soul. Um, maybe a hopper. I guess I I don't know the the full list. Uh, okay, yeah. So there is a hopper. Uh, there is lost souls. So yeah, you're definitely trying. To, I mean, you could even in theory hit lawless and and target them just with you know you give them one card, but you're gonna be making a pretty strong rescue. Mm -hmm. And you've got mm -hmm. you know Simeon Gabriel plus you know five cards that you're drawing with yeah. Denarius and Pretension. So. Yep. Yeah, so that I guess it looks like a, yeah. a, a turn one or a go first, a go first hand. And this deck is especially trying to get a resurrection revealer out and play on turn one just to negate neutral. So it's like that's another way that like having resurrection revealer and priest of Zeus out is pretty annoying. Yep. Yep. And you got the virgin birth. So that's going to turn into yep. another card. My best card um, in my top blank. Yep. Oh, so yeah. That also, that also looks like a, like a go first hand. Mm hmm. Cool. I feel like we touched on a lot of the scenarios you'd want to think about. There's definitely a lot more, but I don't think we could possibly think of all the different scenarios. Yeah, we didn't really touch a whole lot. I guess well, I guess we did talk about stricken quite a bit. 
Um, you know, obviously you have to, you know, you don't get to decide, uh, you know, going first or second, you know, after you've done stars. Um, but that's another thing to think about is that, you know, some of the star abilities, like if you're playing the star abilities that like reserve the top card of opponent's deck or discard yep. the top card of yep. opponent's deck, like delivered is a, you know, obviously a pretty common one that people use. Um, there are people are running the star abilities that say top deck a dominant or top deck a hero from deck. And so if you have some of those, you know, reserve top or discard top, it very, you know, you could use that to make your decision to go second because it's like, okay, you know, yeah, go ahead and, and top deck your resurrection dominant that you're planning to draw and play on turn one. Oh, I'm going to reserve that instead in, with my yeah. star ability. Uh, That's a great point. So yeah. I, I have uh, absolutely reserved a couple of Son of Gods, uh, three woes, um, after people have put them on top with with their star ability and, and me going second with my star ability. Yep. That's a great point. Thanks for mentioning that. Alrighty. I think that's going to do it here. Thanks for watching this little discussion. And I don't know if you want to call it masterclass, but certainly it's educating. I hope it's educating for you guys. Signing off, Justin and Tim. See you guys around next time. See you guys.